Coming up on Global Business, Chinese Premier Li Chan says China hopes to further enrich its comprehensive strategic partnership with Mongolia and should expand cooperation in such areas as energy, tourism and education. China's industrial profits decline at a slower pace in May. We'll also take a closer look at how China's manufacturing sector is making the transition to become more advanced. We take you to day two of the World Economic Forum's Summer Davos as leaders in business, government and academia gather in China's coastal city of Tianjin to discuss the future of the global economy. From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is Global Business. I'm Michelle Vandenberg. Chinese Premier Li Qiang has held talks with visiting Mongolian Prime Minister Oyun Erdin in Beijing. This came after a welcoming ceremony held at the Great Hall of the People. During their meeting, Premier Li said that China and Mongolia are each other's important neighbors. China hopes to further enrich its comprehensive strategic partnership with Mongolia, deepen political trust and cooperation, and accelerate the building of a China-Mongolia community with a shared future. He said that as China supports Mongolia's economic and social development, the two nations should expand cooperation in such areas as energy, tourism and education. Owen Erdian said that in strengthening cooperation with China is a primary direction of Mongolia's foreign policy. He said Mongolia abides by the One China principle and is willing to bring the bilateral ties to a new height. China has been deepening trade ties with Mongolia during the past few years. China has been the largest source of investment and top trade partner of Mongolia for 18 years in a row. Official data showed the total trade between the two sides reached 13.6 billion U.S. dollars in 2022, surpassing the threshold of 10 billion U.S. dollars for two consecutive years. That accounted for around 65 percent of Mongolia's total trade volume last year. Coal and iron ore are the top products exported to China. Besides mineral products, the two nations have been expanding cooperation in renewable energy, agriculture and education. Representatives of China and Vietnam have called for deeper economic and trade ties. The calls came at a meeting Wednesday in Beijing of the China-Vietnam Economic and Trade Cooperation Forum. Sun Ye reports. More than 350 representatives from China and Vietnam attended the China-Vietnam Economic and Trade Cooperation Forum in Beijing on Wednesday. China is Vietnam's biggest trade partner and China has been a growing source of investment for Vietnam in recent years. According to official Vietnamese data, the first half of 2023 has seen Chinese investment in the country amount to almost 2 billion U.S. dollars. Despite uncertainties in the world economy, participants at the forum are expecting expanded economic ties, citing favorable conditions, including the regional comprehensive economic partnership that went into effect last year. In recent years, the economic and trade cooperation between China and Vietnam has continued to deepen, achieving fruitful results, even as the world economy faces challenges. The trade between China and Vietnam has maintained a good momentum. In the first five months of this year, the trade volume between China and Vietnam accounted for nearly one-fourth of China's trade with ASEAN. The industrial and supply chains of China and Vietnam have been deeply interconnected, and the cooperation in the field of investment has achieved remarkable results. China is willing to work with Vietnam to promote the deeper and wider development of economic and trade relations. I have met with representatives from Chinese enterprises to discuss how to create favorable conditions for Chinese enterprises in Vietnam. Through economic and trade cooperation, we hope to contribute to the good relationship between the two parties and two countries. So we propose establishing a working group to specifically promote economic and trade cooperation between the two countries, and we will work even more in the future to deepen cooperation and contribute to bilateral relations.
When meeting with Vietnam's Prime Minister on Tuesday, Chinese President Xi Jinping had said then that the two countries should work together to promote the Belt and Road Initiative, strengthen integration of development strategies, leverage complementary advantages, and deepen practical cooperation in areas like green energy and infrastructure. Sun Ye, CGTN, Beijing. Trade between China and Vietnam became even closer in 2022. Data from Vietnam's Customs Authority shows bilateral trade totaled 176 billion U.S. dollars, up more than 5 percent from that in 2021. Breaking down the numbers, Vietnam's export to China grew 3.2 percent to 58 billion U.S. dollars, while imports from China surged 10 percent to about 118 billion U.S. dollars. China trailed the U.S. as Vietnam's second export market but remain the largest import country. Now, for more discussions on the official visits of the Prime Ministers of Mongolia and Vietnam, let's bring in Liu Zhiqin, Senior Fellow at the Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies at Renmin University of China. Now, Professor Liu, um, you know, first let's talk about Mongolia. What are the main achievements of the Mongolian Prime Minister's visit to China so far? I should say that uh, the achievement they um, have made uh, during this visit uh, more than expected. As we know that uh, Mongolia is a very special inland that has no direct connection for ocean to a sea port. So that's why the Mongolia has uh, big challenges to develop its economy, especially for transportation, to how to get close connections with outside. So at the moment, uh, the, all the talks uh, concentrated on cooperations and the mutual uh, benefits on equal equality. So both sides agreed to have further and deepening the cooperations and uh, uh, good uh, uh, efforts that, to stimulate the uh, business between the two sides, in, especially in the energy side and the, in the logistic and also education, but also in tourism also, that the major uh, part to be discussed. As we know that uh, Mongolia has a great potential in natural resources. For instance, uh, all on the coal miners are the major product to be exported. So all this can be really very good complementary sections for China and for both sides to have cooperate. Especially China can export all the many products that to support the further development in Mongolia. Mongolia need a lot of infrastructure support, and also in uh, health care, and also in high-tech in communications. So all this uh, that China can do uh, much better than ever before. So in this way, that uh, the achievement the, uh, the Mongolia's visit, the visit has already uh, made a great uh, uh, fruits, and also will have a great uh, potential impact on the future cooperation. Now, we know Vietnam's leaders also visited China. Um, what were the highlights there? What are the main areas of cooperation between these two countries? Actually, Vietnam is a, a, a very uh, a special friend of China. As we know, we are good neighbors, we are good uh, brothers, we are good friends also. So in this way, that uh, we have a comprehensive that, uh, strategic cooperation partnership. The meaning of comprehensive that it covers all fields actually. So from the members that of the delegates, we can see that how in great importance they have placed on this visit the defense minister and also the planning industrial minister and the trading and the commercial minister. All this most important section of the of the Vietnam industry that came to China to have to meet and to meet of their counterpart in China. And as we know that that discussion and the negotiation have really reached a very high level, uh, not only for, for the, uh, the commercial contract, actually we build up a better mutual understandings of mutual benefits and the mutual confidence in each other. So this is a very important thing, because as I know in the first five months, Vietnam has met a great challenges. The development in economic slowed down quite sharp. The orders dropped down, and the lay out the workers have great pressure on the society. So they really need China's support assistance. So and also Vietnam has 
beca- become to know who is really the good partner, real partner of Vietnam. Vietnam is a very important emerging market in Asia, so it will play great uh, importance role to develop the globalization. So we hope that in the future, Vietnam and China can really work uh, together, hand in hand, to safeguard all the globalization and to promote uh, better and the equal uh, shared future. You mentioned that uh, you know China and these two countries have great potential in cooperating in the future. How significant are these visits uh, in terms with uh, helping helping boost trade and investment uh, between China and the two countries? As we know that uh, trade, business, and also investment are the major sections from both sides that, that, that to, to be focused. As we know, China invested and uh, uh, a lot in the these two countries in the past years, especially in the first five months, I think China has invested in Vietnam already uh, 10 billion uh, or 1 billion US dollars, so more than uh, uh, the same time last year. So as we know that the investment is the uh, fundamental for uh, further development and the cooperation. And also from other uh, cooperation, not only from the investment, but also from the technology, uh, uh, cooperation will enhance, will strengthen the both sides to have a better position in the global market. As we know, the global market uh, is now in turbulence. We are m- meeting many uh, uncertainties, unexpected uncertainties and the challenges. Only by more investment and the promote more trading to enhance the co- close cooperation and the relations between our three partners that we can really withstand the, all these headwinds and the challenges. And also, we are uh, working together to fight against the, uh, the slowdown of the economic pressure. But actually, China is now the leading uh, power in uh, world economic recovery. So we will do our best to have close uh, cooperation with these two countries. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for your insights. Really appreciate your time. Liu Zhiqin from the Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies at Renmin University of China. Now to China's industrial sector. Data from the National Bureau of Statistics show profits at industrial firms above a designated scale declined 12.6% in May from a year ago. The number also marks a slower drop for a third consecutive month. China Statistics Agency says the sector-wide improvement is attributable to faster profit growth among equipment makers and utility companies, as well as a slower profit drop among consumer goods products. Many cities and provinces around China are promoting the establishment of zero-carbon factories, ones that offset their carbon emissions with energy-saving re-engineering techniques and investments in emission reduction projects. Our Zhang Shixuan took a trip to one of these factories in Shanghai. With a production capacity of more than 80 million boxes of medicine a year, these non-stop pharmaceutical production lines have an endless demand for air conditioners. That means a huge demand for energy. And so the reduction of carbon emissions is high on this company's agenda. Much of the factory's air conditioning system has now been upgraded. The company's introduced new equipment like heat pumps and heat pipes to recycle the heat, as well as a new carbon emission management system. The entire rooftop is now covered with photovoltaic panels. You might have thought that creating a green factory like this would require a prohibitive amount of investment, a series of new systems and installations. For this factory, it cost around 7.5 million yuan during the past decade to reduce carbon emissions. But the investment has already paid off, and the factory says it's even created new economic benefits. Our three-dimensional heat pipes have the highest investment return rate. We got our costs back in just a few months. For those with slower investment returns like photovoltaic panels, we make our investment back in six or seven years, but they can be used for more than 20 years, which means that after we get our costs back, we can be operating at no cost but only saving money for more than 10 years. As of 2021, this factory in Shanghai's Zhangjiang Science City had already saved 31 million yuan in energy costs, more than four times the money spent on its upgrades. 
Especially for photovoltaic technologies, China is leading the globe, so we are very happy to buy Chinese products. Now there's a new type of panel made of perovskite, which is more flexible. Once that technology is commercialized, we plan to cover our entire building with photovoltaic panels. This is just one of the 20 companies which has been awarded a zero-carbon certificate by the Shanghai government. The Pudong New Area has launched new policies. Each zero-carbon factory receives an award of 500,000 yuan. Leading foreign invested firms are playing a demonstration and leading role in green transformation. They include Bosch, Siemens and Schneider. Many local companies in the automobile, pharmaceutical and consumer goods industries have all moved up to go zero carbon. This has all triggered new demands for well-educated talent in the field. At the end of 2020, Shanghai Jiao Tong University established a college of smart energy to cultivate new professionals that have a good command of both smart technologies and clean energy. Our smart energy engineering major is the first such undergraduate major of its kind in China. In the future, the energy studies will be combined with internet technologies and AI. Liu says that the employment situation has turned out well beyond expectations. An action plan released by the city government calls for Shanghai to have 150 green manufacturing demonstration firms by 2025. Zhang Shuxuan, ICS for CGTN, Shanghai. You're watching Global Business, still to come. We take you to day two of the World Economic Forum Summer Davos as leaders in business, government and academia gather in China's coastal city of Tianjin to discuss the future of the global economy. Foster entrepreneurship, reinvigorate innovation, transition into green development, or among a diverse range of topics at this year's Summer Davos. Faced with an increasingly complicated geopolitical landscape and frequent financial volatility, policymakers and leading industry leaders share their insights on the most pressing global issues. How to unleash the full potential of small and medium-sized enterprises? How to reap the benefit of AI while mitigating its risks? How to reboot the global economy in a post-pandemic era towards a sustainable future for all? Join us for a special coverage of the 14th annual meeting of the new champions, only on CGTN. Now let's turn to the World Economic Forum Summer Davos, which is on its second day in Tianjin. The day's agenda was highlighted by a discussion on the world's global debt of $300 trillion and growing debt risks in developing countries. The forum also discussed ways to foster new skills for fast developing industries and how societies can better embrace the AI revolution. The afternoon agenda tackled the future of money and payment systems, Asia's sustainability efforts and China's blueprint for digitalization and climate financing. Now for more highlights of today's summer Davos, let's cross to my colleague Lily Liu in Tianjin who has more on the ground. Lily, take it away. Yes, this is day two at Summer Davos 2023, and many of the discussions today are as surrounded around topics on green technology, sustainable development, and they're definitely in spotlight here at this year's meetings. And what is more important is that all this discussion goes beyond words. Well, the forum has witnessed the introduction of a number of reports and initiatives to bring these discussions into action. Well, the forum launched a new report outlining a roadmap for China to develop its market for green hydrogen, which is a key enabler for the country to deliver on its carbon neutrality objectives. And China's hydrogen development is faced with challenges of cost, infrastructure and demand, while the report proposes 35 enabling measures to be executed in the th three phases from now until 2030. And this is expected to be a positive step towards the uh, coordinated development of the hydrogen economy, which enables economic societal, energy system and security benefits. 
And also, there's the Task Force on Green Value Chains for China. It was launched here at this year's annual meeting of the new Champions 2023. Well, it aims to encourage global supply chain actors who enter the China market to alleviate deforestation caused by soybeans, palm oil, beef, pulp and paper, and other commodities. And market leaders operating in China, including China Mongol Dairy, L'Oreal, Nestle, Cargo, and Bungie, have signed up to that task force. And today, Today, a report that tracks energy transition points out that major emerging economies with, hu- uh, with high uh, future energy demand, including China, India, Brazil, and Indonesia, have made significant improvements on energy transition. So, green energy also received wide attention among participants at the Winter Davos back in January. In fact, country leaders, including those from the European Union, faced a race to make green pitches, pledging unprecedented investment. In clean energies. So let me go to my colleague Julia Lubova, who's in Gen- uh, Geneva. Hi there, Julia. What do you have for us in terms of how this subject uh, resonates as one of the uh, imminent global matters? Well, that's right. The World Economic Forum's annual meeting in Davos in January, Green Energy, was high on the agenda, in particular the green energy transition. Uh, some uh, more than 70 countries have set net zero carbon emission targets, and transitioning to a low carbon energy is one of the main ways to hit this target. Well, business leaders and politicians at Davos, they agreed that this transition is possible, but it's not going to be easy. So the pace of the transition is too slow slow according to some policymakers, but also that it's going to be different for every country and there is no common silver bullet for all. And uh, so but the, also the chief of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, uh, he called on business leaders in Davos to make accountable net zero pledges. Guterres said that credible benchmarks should be used to avoid any greenwashing. So there are clearly many hurdles uh, on the way to this green energy transition and they need to be addressed. Yes, Julia, indeed. I mean, when we talk about innovation entrepreneurship at this year's summer Davos here, we need to find out how uh, entrepreneurs can truly take advantage of those global challenges and try to develop businesses that are social friendly. In the meantime, they should be uh, rewarding, beneficial to everyone and also benefit to the societal development. Well, that's it from my end for now. Back to you in the studio, Michelle. Great stuff. Thank you so much, Lily, for that and looking forward to more coverage from you uh, tomorrow. Now, earlier, my colleague Gwen Xin spoke to Minister of Economic Inclusion, Small Business, Employment and Skills of Morocco. He shared his insights on the impact of AI tech on the country's job market and the potential areas where China and Morocco can deepen cooperation. AI is definitely one of the major challenges in the future. Uh, the trends of the uh, labor market are uh, being confirmed. One of the major trends is the transformation from employment to work. Mm. Basically with this G- Z generation yeah. that wants to work in a different way. AI comes with disruptions. Maybe one third of the jobs would completely disappear and the 70% remaining jobs will rely on AI in a way or another to be performed. Digital uh, 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 skills are one of the skills that we absolutely need to infuse. We have complete digital villages in these cities where young students are being trained to bridge the gap, in particular, in digital skills. So for us, investing in digital skills is important for us to be prepared to the next generation of jobs. Talking about China-Morocco collaboration, we know uh, the forum is talking about a lot of global challenges. We're facing a multi-crisis in the world today. In your opinion, in what areas China and Morocco can further deepen cooperation? Uh, Green transition is a good area where we can cooperate together. Mm -hmm. Uh, Enhancing the uh, technological uh, capacities is also an important one. Um, uh, solar energy, eolian energy, and uh, so many other areas. And uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, in, uh, Chinese investments in Morocco. And what is important is that the investments we have are operated under uh, 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 
private-public partnerships as well. Mm -hmm. So we have also very good governance models that shape our relationships, and I think that this is what distinguishes the relationship between China and Morocco uh, uh, compared to many other relationships uh, mm -hmm. in the world. Mm. Well, this year marks the 10th anniversary of the Belt and Road Initiative and Morocco uh, joined the initiative in 2017. How do you view this ongoing cooperation and what further potential uh, can China and Morocco tap into? Already we have a big project in Morocco called the Tanger City, Sec, City Tech mm. project that is uh, uh, entirely uh, uh, done with uh, the authorities and the corporations of your country. So it's a big city of technology that is uh, 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 that uh, receives investments uh, and that is designed with uh, 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 a Chinese, uh, 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 let's say, let's say, uh, uh, partnership. So I think that it's very promising to diversify our partnerships, to make sure our youth, our uh, women, our skills, our talents benefit from the partnerships that we do. This is why we need to uh, reinforce the exchange of skills and, uh, and studies between our two nations. As we wrap up coverage of the second day at the Summer Davos, let's get a recap of the major issues business leaders have been talking about at the forum. China is the world's leading economy on digital penetration. 40% of the economy is driven by digital, at least when I looked at the numbers a year back and it allows to unleash even more possibilities. The business are investing a lot in the digital transformation, in particular uh, manufacturing, smart manufacturing, AI, uh, cloud computing are the areas uh, we believe contribute uh, to the next wave of uh, digital transformation. Not for China only, it's, it's to global economy. Anything related to the new energy transition, to mm. the green energy transition for us, is an important customer market. Mm -hmm. Today, the penetration rates of electric vehicles in China are something like 30%. Um, China today has a 60% global market share of, uh, of electric vehicles, um, and it's going very fast. Also, some of the largest manufacturers of electric vehicles, batteries, and associated technology are based here. So, um, in, in a way, the, the, the global green energy transition is only possible with China. China will, in a few years, be the biggest economy in the world. So it's going to be a very important market, both for us and, and for everybody else. Uh, we also see that the Chinese consumers, they are taking up innovative new products faster than what we see in other markets. So already today, we see strong demand and, and the requests for our products. So both because we, we see that today and the, the, the future that lays ahead of us, we see that investing in, in China uh, is like investing in the future. And that will do it for this edition of Global Business here on CGTN. I'm Michelle Vandenberg in Beijing. Thank you for watching. Bye for now.